wow, this is a great semester that we're finishing up, and it's been a really amazing time. How many here really sense in your heart that just that God's really doing things in this class and planting things that are eternal? Like, isn't it amazing to be in a call like this? It's just fantastic. Um, is the review sheet helpful to you? Okay. How many here take notes and you find these things in your notes? Put your hand up. Okay, great. Because I've had some tell me they didn't know where these questions came from. And I'm like, I think they're missing something. All right. Um, I'm not so sure if it's wise to go over all of this, but maybe just the things that really matter. I think you probably would do well on, even without any help at all. Um, Okay, number one, what mandate from God should my occupation not hinder? Yeah. Yes. Everyone hear that? The Great Commission. The Great Commission. What is meant by this question anyway? Like, it's a issue of priorities in our life, isn't it? And um, is this in the Bible at all? This specific kind of thought, like the difference between my occupation and my call. Like Ephesians 4.1, Paul mentions his vocation. It's where we get the word calling. And he considered his calling to be at the top. He considered his calling to be a divine summons from God. So this is why these kind of questions are just to stir our hearts up because most of us, when we go looking for a job, we think of being employed in a manner in which we can still be effective for the kingdom of God. And there are uh, jobs out there that can, can hinder that, to say the least. Um, has anyone ever turned a job down that interfered with your call? Oh, great. So you know what we're talking about. Awesome. That would sound strange to the world, especially at a time like this when jobs are hard to find, that you have that kind of thinking. But that's like awesome. Uh, church growth should include what? Huh? Put your hand up if you know. Yeah. Missions and? Huh? Which would be, in, which uh, evangelism would include discipleship. But the two things, missions and evangelism. In other words, can you have church growth with numbers and money and a, and a, a great budget going on in your church and, 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 uh, and, not be having um, missions or evangelism. Have you ever seen a church like that that was flourishing with numbers and finances, but they didn't have a heart for the lost? And that's not church growth at all. And there is a lot of that out there. Um, no Second Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Really, you should... No, Second Timothy four seven eight. It would be pretty self-explanatory. If you you know, if you look at your notes and you see class number eleven, a certain topic that was covered on that, it would be wise to go over it. So I don't think there's really a need to say anything about that, except that there was a theme that was discussed repetitiously in your notes, and that was just one of many verses listed on that theme. Uh, the next one, Acts 13, 2 and 3. This is a question dealing with um, elders putting their hands on people and sending them out. And the question that I have for you is, who sends people out? Is it God only? Or does God also use 
men of God to send you out? What would be your answer? Huh? He uses both, right? Like the Holy Spirit would call you to go on the mission field, so does that just mean you just simply go? Or is there a, is there a covering? Is there a, in the book of Acts, did the church lay hands on people and send them? Did they? Huh? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Why is that? That's, like, that's for our benefit, isn't it? And it's for our blessing that the men of God in a local assembly would put their hands, that they would fast, that they would pray, and that they would send you out. And they might just know some things about where you're going that they could offer wisdom as a covering for that also. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.14, self-explanatory. Uh, number six, in Ephesians 4.16, how does the body of Christ function best? Yes. Yes, when it's connected. Or if someone were to ask you depend, uh, dependently or independently, which would it be? It's very dependent, isn't it? Every joint supplies. I believe the quote that Dr. Stevens gave on that class was the body of Christ functions best dependently, not independently. Uh, define suno gizomai. Yeah. Yes, okay, that's great. To strive to share together in a contest. And another word, a good one, is persevere. But what she said is exactly right. To strive or to share together in a contest. Remember the word strive is one that we really refrain from because it has the tendency to imply a works type program or the energy of the flesh trying to do something. Um, no Ephesians 4.32. That was one of those repetitious things also. Anyone I have a guess at what I'm talking about when I say repetitious? There was like a list of things in that chapter that were given with many verses, and it all had to do with a key word. What's Ephesians 4.32 say? Forgive one another for whose sake? Christ's sake. The body's sake. Your sake. The Lord's sake. Remember that class? That will be key for you to know. Um, what two areas were Jewish believers disloyal? Somebody else. I want to get, like, get involved with this. Yeah. Excellent. Two things, the cross and categorical doctrine. What is condemned by God as a system of works? Ramir. Yes. Religion is a satanic counterfeit for what? Yeah. Yes. A relationship with God. That's such a great definition, isn't it? Like when you think of religion and what like in this day and age that we are living in, religion is really promoted as like all religion is good. And we, we were really taught well in this class to like to be, um, to define what religion is and what the source is behind it. It's just really excellent. Why is religion a great destroyer of human freedom? Yeah.
Absolutely. It is a works program. It puts people into bondage to a works program. If you're in bondage to a works program, you're not set free. Uh, what is man-centered to solve man's problem by man's efforts? Yeah? Yes. That was tough. Uh, no Proverbs 17, 13. Um, what happens when divine good is attacked? No. Proverbs. You need to know Proverbs 17, 13. In, in light of that, if you were to read that verse, what happens when you attack divine good? Huh? Say it. Evil what? Evil shall not depart from his house. Wow. That's pretty intense, isn't it? Think about, well, I don't think I ever attacked divine good, but if I'm criticizing a fruitful ministry, what am I doing? Or if I'm criticizing a person who is struggling in their marriage or in some situation at work, what am I doing? You know? It's like, wow, this, this is great instruction. Uh, de define the effects of the head demon, Hoopsoma. Yeah. Right, first thing is he is the demon of what? Of the air. And some of the results are sickness. What else? You have Ramir? Emotional problems. Okay. Um, causes sickness and prehistoric sins. Preservation from the cross was a key one to that. Preservation from the cross. Just to help you out with some other aspects of defining what Hoopsoma is behind. Um, how about define the effects of the head demon, Bathos? Somebody else. Yeah, Dave. Okay, first of all, it's the demon of the elements or the dust. Okay. Some of the aspects of this influence of this demon. Okay. Central sins. How about wisdom from below? Drugs. And sensual sins. That is correct. Name seven things out of the 14 given in class as a solution to overcome demonic attacks. When you think of these two particular demons and their influence on mankind, especially attacks against the believer, what is God's provision that he has set up for our protection from this? And there was like 14, 13 or 14 given. Yeah, Ramir. Pastor Teacher was the first one. Ephesians 4 11. Yeah. Huh? Recovery, 1 John 1 9. Yes. Categorical doctrine, Isaiah 28 9 and 10. Body life, Ephesians 1 23. Local assembly, Hebrews 10.25. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you had one? Did I? Go ahead. Faith obedience, Hebrews 4.2. Without the mixing of faith, it profits nothing. Yeah. Obedience to the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Mark 16, 15. 
Proverbs 11.30, Daniel 12.3. You don't need to know all those verses, but it's good to know that, that they're there to support why you feel that you have this divine provision from heaven. What else? Ah, the obedience to the great commandment to love one another. Any more? Okay. I don't know how many that is, but that more than covers what you would need. Um, one of them was taking up your cross. I, I don't know if we got that one. Galatians 2.20. To live in the government of God is another one that is our protection in 1 John 4.4. 4. Um, grace orientation, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Did we give corporate body life? I think so. Ephesians 1.23. And that should cover it. You don't need to know all of them, but you should know you should actually should know some of these just for your own like thought process, right? Just like it's awesome to have this in your heart. Um, define demonization. Actually, I think I have like two questions on the test on this. One of them is define demonization. The other one has to do with knowing the difference between demonization and demon possession. What is demonization? Yeah. Yeah, that the key word that he's saying is the word influence. Um you might hear the term in Christian circles and even in this ministry the term is demon obsession. It's the same thing. There's a difference between obsession or influence from possession. So demon influence is, is when a person is being influenced by the atmosphere or demonic um, atmospheric projections. Um, what's the difference between demonization and demon possession? Yeah. That is a true statement. What is the difference? Right, demonization or demon influence can also control the vocal cords as we saw with Peter, who tried to counsel Jesus not to go to the cross. But the difference between possession is, is when a person is demon-possessed, they have been indwelled by a demon. Demons cannot find their home in your body because of greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. person whose vocal cords are being used, that person is demon influenced. They are being influenced by demons. Of course, if you're demon possessed, obviously your vocal cords would be used too. But in Peter's case, Peter being a believer and King Saul being a believer, they both spoke on behalf of, of demons. And they actually produced actions that were based upon that influence. King Saul wanted to kill David, even though he knew that David was a man after God's own heart, that God had his hand on David. He even said, I know that, that God is with you. Then he tried to murder him. And he wasn't, he wasn't demon-possessed, but he was certainly being influenced. And so was Peter, and so are we when we um, speak on behalf of our emotions and sometimes atmospheric projections. So you know the difference between the two. One is an influence and one is a indwellment or indwelled by a demon. Um, and a good point, too. A believer cannot be indwelled by demons. Define theantric action in 2 Peter 1.5. Anyone? 
somebody else. Yeah, Mohib. Okay, I like the first part. God's nature doing what? Through you, but not through the old sin nature. Huh? In spite of. Yes. Okay, anyone else? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. That's excellent. I'll tell you, I'll give you what I have. I, I would accept both of them because they're both excellent, but I would rather, uh, let's see. One of the statements he said that was really good is, is a divine government, government governing our soul. And if you read First Peter, Second um, Peter chapter one verse five, it talks about having this divine nature through the promises. So it's the word of God in my soul that is bearing fruit and giving me this divine nature that is not normally my own nature. It's not part of my old sin nature, but it is the nature of God Himself because of His word coming in and having its place in my heart. So it's God's nature functioning in man, a divine government governing our soul. Either one. As long as you can expre express in words that it is God's nature functioning in you, that is like very accurate and correct, okay? Is there any confusion on this? Okay. Um... What can a mature believer do in difficult situations to get a solution for their life? Yes. Oh, that's pretty good. What about, he was talking about precepts. The ability to receive precepts and apply them in life. The ability to to receive precepts, this is Isaiah 28, 9 and 10, precept upon precept, and apply them in the details of life. Is maturity based upon how long you've been in the church? How about based upon how much activity you do in service in the church? No. No. Okay. So funny, when you ask these true and false questions, somebody will surely say, oh yeah, you know, it's true. I don't know, understand why it gets confusing. Um, why did the Jews not like Paul's call? It was like the basic thing behind that. Yeah. Exactly. And what was behind it? What, what, what hard issue was going on? Very good. It was a pride issue. <clears throat> Another key word would be they were prejudiced against the Gentiles. How could God go to them when we are the chosen ones? Has anyone ever um, disregarded your call and not and made light of it? I think many of us, I think I asked the question, how many here have ever been, had somebody say something negative about your call? And it's like more, more than half the class put their hand up. So we understand that this is a spiritual thing that only a spiritual people are going to understand and see. Um, security test will reveal what? Oh, let me get someone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that would have been good for a midterm answer on another question. It was very similar. Uh, yeah. Okay, what else? Loyalty. Loyalty. 
What kind of loyalty? True loyalty, right? Loyalty to what? Loyalty to what? I mean, you could be, there's all kinds of loyalty. Yeah. Yeah, loyalty to Christ, loyalty to the Word. This is not talking loyalty to a personality or a friendship, but is loyalty to the Word of God. So security test, when I get put in a place, we get put in a place where we lose that sense of security and comfort zone that we so much like. We, it will reveal where our loyalties lie. Genesis 49, 6, too, is a good verse for that, by the way. <clears throat> Joseph would not unite his honor with a couple of his kids because they were self-willed. He was not going to be loyal just because they were his children. So that was like a, a great example, I think, of loyalty. He knew where to put his loyalty. All right, uh, when, I am, when am I free to do God's will? This is a great one. Pastor Gabe. Come on, somebody else. I'm, anybody else they have, like, come on. Yeah. Yes. Say that again. Yeah, and I seek the kingdom of God first. Matthew 6.33. I mean, why are we free? Well, let's think about this for a minute. I just like, I don't, um, it's great if you get it right on the test, but do you understand it? Is if seeking the kingdom of God first, does that set me free? Like, doesn't it set me free? Or does it put me in bondage? If I seek the kingdom of God first, then my priorities are correct. I'm not seeking selfish gains from my own personal flesh which usually doesn't that put you in bondage? But seeking the kingdom of God first is when we discover true freedom. Okay. Um, Colossians 1.20. How is peace established in Colossians 1.20? Yeah, through the blood. Romans 5.10. Oh, that's a good one. Romans 5.10. We're rec reconciled by something and saved by something. What is it? Besides Dakota, yeah. Reconciled by his death and saved by what? Huh? His life. Very good. Uh, what did the serp oh uh, what did the serpent being lifted up represent? Yeah, what did the serpent being lifted up represent? It's like I, I know I'm going to get a lot of answers on this, but what was the reason for lifting up the serpent? Why is Christ to be lifted up? Why was this done the way it was done publicly? Yeah. That is exactly right. And that's lengthy, but that is exactly right. He was lifted up, number one, publicly to show a victory over sin, death, and the devil. It was a public display. And there's some crucial times that God did things publicly. The ascension was done in the eyes of people on purpose that victory of Christ being ascended. What did you have to do when the serpent was lifted up on the pole to be healed from snake bites or infections? Huh? What was the one thing you had to do? Yeah, just look. That's, that's like, isn't that a picture of how we're healed? We look at Christ, we look at his word. We don't work for it, we just simply look and mix faith. Yeah. Devil. Um, 
Is peace conditional or unconditional? In Isaiah 26, 3. I, do you have peace because you're born again? Or is it, come on, is it conditional or unconditional? Mohib. Okay, tell me what the verse says that leads you to say it's conditional. What does the verse actually say? What is the condition? Perfect peace, how? Yeah. Either one. Okay, so you, what if your mind is stayed on your failure? Do you have perfect peace? Not hardly. So, deliverance comes when I exercise my mind in agreement with what God has said. Right? He is faithful and just to forgive us when we confess our sins. So I need to have my mind focused on what God has said. I have my mind focused on the, the infections of the snake bites, the failures, the sin, the fault, the wrongdoing, my past in Adam, there will be no peace. Okay. Um, Romans 5.10. No, we did that. Um, Number 28, what is a good indicator that we are approved by God? Dakota. Okay. It, this is in relationship to class number 18. Yeah. You're, you're in the right track. Yeah. What kind of suffering? Okay, go ahead. Persecution. From who? From the world? You mean when the world disapproves of you and persecutes you, that that could be an indication of God's approval? Where would you find in the Bible? How about Luke 6.26? Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. It's like we don't need the approval of the world, do we? In fact, if the world disapproves of you in certain ways... It'd be God's approval upon your life that you're walking with him. I mean, were the, were the prophets, the apostles, the disciples, were they approved of by the world? Were they being applauded for their walk after Jesus? Not hardly. Um, no, 2 Timothy 3.12. What happens to people that live godly? They have a very comfortable and blessed life, right? Now, what does it say? Yeah? They suffer what? Persecution. Okay. Wow, this doesn't sound so encouraging. But actually it is. It's very encouraging. Define mark, give the Greek word, and the meaning. Come on, I've got to get somebody out. Yeah, in the back. Huh? Go ahead. Huh? Scopeo, okay. And what does it mean? That's, that's exactly right. To examine carefully. Very good. You're right. So you have the Greek word and what it means, right? To examine carefully. Scopeo. I think it's S-K-O-P-E-O. -E Is that correct? Some of you. Okay. Um, what is the only solution for sin? It's actually two things, but they're combined in one. Yeah. Yeah, de death and the shedding of blood. Uh, Romans 3.23. I'm going to skip that one because I know you'll get that. Define glory. 
to find glory. It was like a very simple definition that he gave. Very helpful. Yeah. Yes. But it's, um, it is the manifestation of God's nature. But the key about glory is it's a reflective nature. It's a reflective nature of God. A good example of a reflective nature is the moon would be undetectable if it weren't for the fact that it's in the vicinity of the sun. And the sun is reflected off the moon and you see the glory of the moon, but actually what you're seeing is the light that's from the sun. The same way that when you and I are in God's presence and we spend time in the atmosphere of body life, and in the presence of God, we begin to reflect that character in nature, and that is called glory. Moses spent time on the mount with God. What did he do when he came down? He, his face shined because he spent time with God. Yeah, you, you're going to say something? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if, like, I think we're, we're having two different thoughts. One of them is, I don't know about solid, but the only solid thing is Christ. We get around him. We, we, the best that we have in this life is a reflection of who he is. Yeah. Very good. So that's a good answer. There you go. I didn't know that. Light has weight. Wow. Thank you for that. Would never have guessed that light has weight. Yes. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay, no Proverbs 6.19. What is it like this very important about Proverbs 6.19 that's so crucial to you and I? That we are warned in the Word of God. We know that Proverbs 6.16 and 19 deals with seven things that God hates. And some of the sins of Christianity that people think are so horrendous, and yes, they are so bad, but they're not mentioned in this, these different things verses of things that God hates. For example, like adultery is not mentioned. Um, homosexuality is not mentioned. But many of these sins are sins of the mind and the tongue. I think all but one. And actually you could include murder as also one that could be of the tongue. When you assassinate somebody's character, that is a form of murder. So what is the one that was key though? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It it's, doesn't say tail, tail bearer, though, in verse 19. What does it say? He that sows what? Discord, which is a tail bearer, but a person that sows discord. You think of the word sow. When you sow a seed in the ground, you plant it. doesn't do damage immediately. It just takes time for it to bear fruit. Sowing discord can be somebody just sharing a dislike that they have in the body, in the church, uh, in the business that they work for, and they just start sowing negative statements on the outreach team, negative statements that just don't edify. And usually it has a little bit of truth with it, but it's sowing something that is tearing down a fruitful work of God. That's why it's so serious. Um, name the four kinds of evil. Give the Greek meanings. We are, I already gave this, but I think... Any, did anyone here not get this? Okay. For those that didn't get it, the first one is kakos. K-A-K-O-S. It is intrinsic evil. Meaning... The evil is on the inside, and it's self-contained. 
It is not necessarily doing damage to anyone else, but it's in me. Evil always begins with the emotions, war against the mind. Second one is poneros, and that is infectious evil. P-O-N-E-R-O-S. A good verse for that is Proverbs 4.16. And a good verse for Kakos is Romans 7.21. Communal is the third one. Communal evil. That's where we get together with a little group of friends. That's what uh, Korah did. Small group had an issue with Moses, had a discussion about it. They began to rehearse things that they were not happy with. Just a minute. Communal evil, small group, Proverbs 4, 14 to 17, and John 16, 2. And they usually think they're doing it for God's sake. Yeah, you had a quick question? For what? Communal is the Greek word, communal and conspiratorial. I think you asked that before. Yeah, I believe so. And conspiracies is conspiratorial. Conspir con communal is C-O-M-M-U-N-A-L. You're asking somebody who's not, my strength is spelling, but I'm pretty sure that's exactly what it is. Communal. Conspiratorial is nationwide evil. Nationwide. Psalm 2, where nation rises against nation. Conspiratorial, you want me to spell it? <laughs> okay, C-O-N-S-P-I-R-A-T-O-R-I-A-L. And two more, number 36. Yeah, you don't have that one. Well, if you don't want it, it's okay, but it's going to be on the test. Question is, can you be anointed and die the sin unto physical death? Prove it. Who do you know in the Bible was definitely anointed and died under the sin of physical death? Yeah, Saul. Okay, uh. Uh, number 37, we went over that one. We don't need to do it again. That's the difference between demonization and demon possession. You know that? Comfortable with, with every Okay, any questions before we depart? Yes. Yeah, a brief answer for demonization is simply being influenced by demons. Influence, like you can be so, we can be so easily influenced by a best friend. Can we not be influenced by atmospheric projections? By the way, people who are demon Demon eyes often um, live in this Isaiah 44:20 principle where they feed on ashes. They feed on their past. They feed on their failures. They feed on what people think about them, on negative things, and they just rehearse it in their mind. And demons just love this. They will just play with your mind and try to persuade you that you're really worthless and you have no place in the body and you don't fit in and the pastor doesn't really think highly of you and on and on. They just play games with the mind, demon influence. They'll even stir you up to try to redirect something that the cross is doing in your life. So, Father, we pray, bless these thoughts Bless every one of these questions as something that can be used as a resource from heaven for future days in our life. And we pray for just divine recall, but more important than that, we pray that you would just 
plant them in our heart and let them be something that will have great eternal value in days to come. In Jesus' name, amen.